I'm happy to welcome Sabine Vogel for this conversation. My name is Volker Strebel and we want to take a chance to learn more about Sabine's artistic practice in the field of environmental performance, uh, improvisation, composition, conceptual art, if you will, and also sound art. And I would like to start us off with my question to Sabine to please explain to us a little bit about your concept of the recorded landscapes. Recorded Landscapes is a project uh, that deals with homeland, identity, and it's a project where I go with fellow musicians, artists to their homeland, and they share a place in nature with me. And we spend a couple of days there, take our time, tune in, do recordings, improvise together, and then I create afterwards an audiovisual piece out of these recordings. And ideally, it's two versions then in the end. It's a fixed media version existing and then also a version where we play live to it. So I understand correctly that you and the follow musician go at a specific place outdoors. Yes. And then what happens? What are you doing there? First, we tune in. Tuning in is a metho uh, method that I'm using to connect to a place. Mm -hmm. It's a connection to an outdoor place. Environment can be also inside. And it's also connecting to the person I'm there with. And this implies listening to the environment, but it also implies telling stories to each other. When you go to a place that somebody knows very well, there are a lot of memories mm -hmm. to this place. And this makes me knowing the person better and also knowing the place better. And so we spend time there. That's very crucial in this project, that you mm -hmm. have time. That's not like running there, doing something and then leaving. It's really taking your time and um, connect to what there is. And then it can, very, it can be very different. Um, I did a piece with Marta Zapparoli. She's a sound artist from Italy living in Berlin, and she took me to her village that's close to Verona. And she shared a place with me um, that she never ever shared with somebody else. Even her sister didn't know this place. So this was a place where she went as a child, when she needed her space, when she needed to think. And so I was the first person who knew about this place. And this was very special. And the first day, I felt like I disturbed there. Mm -hmm. So we tried to improvise together. Marta Sabaroli plays tapes and antennas. So she literally tunes into the environment with her antennas. Beautiful. <laughs> and I started to play. So we played together. And then I stopped playing and stepped back because I had the feeling I was like a... Um, like an invader? Like an invader, yes. Mm -hmm. So I stepped back and just started to observe her. And so I filmed her, I recorded, recorded her. And um, the next day she, she had to go somewhere else. So I went alone back to this place and, this, and, and kind of introduced myself to the place. And then it was okay. It was really interesting to observe. Then we could play together and we came up with ideas, putting antennas on the ground, just filming this and built up slowly a structure um, and developed it together. And we also, or that's part of all recorded landscapes pieces is that 
I use details from the place, which then kind of work as a graphic notation mm -hmm. later in the piece, but also can be also on site immediately, like I see a stone and play it or something like this can happen. When you approach an artist and ask them to do a realization like this with you, what do you share beforehand? I share the idea of this and um, often, often it's like I tell people about this project and it's interesting, very often people immediately start thinking what place would it be I would bring Sabine to. Mm -hmm. So um, this is how it can happen. Then Marta I did know very well already before. Also I did a piece with Bijana Vuchkova. She's a Bulgarian violinist also living in Berlin and she brought me to the coast of the Black Sea. And uh, we spent a couple of days at the beach, even sleeping at the beach, mm -hmm. really staying there for five days. And also Bijana I did know very well, and uh, Bennett Hawk is another person. We were together in Landscape Quartet, and so this was pretty clear, you know, to do this with these people. And now the piece I did um, while, uh, during my stay at the Villa Aurora is with uh, Philip Greenleaf. He's a saxophonist living in Oakland, but he grew up in Los Angeles. And um, I met Philip 2004 when I was on tour in the US. We met briefly, we played together and somehow I followed his work and I could see that he's also a person who's very strong, very connected to nature. And he often goes out in the fields and the parks 
and just plays a saxophone there. So I thought this is the right person for this project and I wrote to him, explained the project and he said, yes, I think I take you to the Joshua Tree Park. Mm -hmm. And this is where we went to. I get the impression from your description of this project that this is very much in an oral tradition. You don't have a concept of a fixed composition or a conceptual score that you share. Is this correct? And if so, why don't you have a score that you send to participants? A score would make any sense on this project because okay. it's a project that's a process mm -hmm. and it's some it's uh, we develop something together even if I then take the material and compose with it it's a project that's based on being there together on improvising together improvising with the natural environment with the landscape that's there being influenced by it because I think I do have my vocabulary on the flute, but there is an influ influence on me and my co-player where we are. And there is the natural forces that can distract or contribute to what we are doing. So there is no way to do a score in beforehand. Mm -hmm. But what we do is sometimes, like with Iliana, we found these little stones, it's like little pebbles. They are completely mm -hmm. white and have very fine black lines. And they look like a graphic score. So we used these stones as a score then. But this was not planned beforehand. Like we went along the beach, found them, and then was mm -hmm. like, oh, this looks like a score. So mm -hmm. we used it as a score.
Have you ever been disappointed, like that somebody would introduce you to a place and you thought, I can't really connect to this landscape, I don't find my entrance point? Or were there situations where it took you a really long time to connect to the place? Not yet. <laughs> okay. The project is quite young. So I started 2019 with four pieces with uh, Marta Sabaroli, Biljana Vuchkova, Bennett Hawk and a solo piece that I created in Bavaria where I grew up. And now I did the piece with Philip Greenleaf. Um, so it hasn't happened yet. It was always uh, very inspiring and all the pieces are very different. Like what we experienced or what I experienced was very different. Like every person is different, every landscape we enter or I don't know if this is the right word, but it's different. And the landscape is a co-player. It's a very um, mm -hmm. crucial co-player in this project. Would you consider your work environmental in a sense of the fact that you are also addressing environmentalist concerns? Yes, I would say so, because I feel so nature or being outside is very important for me. It was always. I'm a typically country girl. And um, so my, I, yeah, I have environmental concerns. And I think, I hope with my art, um, I can make people aware of what's, what's around them. It's really about uh, treating where we live in a very respectful way. And I hope this, uh, this is something I would like to do with my art, you know, like when I go out in the field, I go and listen. I hope that people f listen different maybe after they perceived my work. When you introduced the concept of the recorded landscapes, you used the word homeland. So it's not just the question of the landscape or nature in general, but also specifically the relationship of the fellow artists you're collaborating with and their relation to this area. Am I understanding this correctly, that you are also interested in the more soci sociological or political implications of the connection of certain people to the environment? Yeah, maybe, I don't know politically, but it's, I think where we grew up, it really influences us who we are. Maybe that's a naive thinking, but um, I mean, I grew up on the Bavarian countryside with clear water and I feel very connected to it. I think that's mm -hmm. somehow the main reason why I started this project because um, I moved away from there and I, I still feel like this is my home. And mm -hmm. I know in Germany, it's always so difficult like to, to say the word Heimat, but it's where my roots are. Why is it difficult? Because of the Nazis and the kind of this whole national thing, I feel mm -hmm. like. But, um, but it's, for me, it's, it's where my roots are and where I kind of belong to. And interesting, I, I read an interview with Pauline Esteves. I hope I pronounce it right. She's a Timbisha Shoshone in the so-called Death Valley. They call it Timbisha, actually, which... And she fought, really, that they get a piece of land back mm -hmm. in the National Park. And she achieved to get a piece of land back for, their tribe, for her tribe. Because she says this is 
my homeland, this is my culture, this is mm -hmm. who we are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for me, this I totally I can totally understand this. Mm -hmm. um, and even if I now I think I wouldn't move back to Bavaria, I'm not so sure about it, but I would back immediately to the landscape, let's say yeah. like this. I immediately would move back to this place. Mm -hmm. It's a different topic what's around it. Yeah. But so, so I'm really speaking here about the nature and the landscape that's kind of influencing who I am and all these memories we have there that makes us who we are. How would you describe who you are in terms of your artistic practice? You are a flutist, you are an um, improviser, you are a composer maybe, you are an author of the documentation or the videos that are related to your work. Are you a composer, performer? Are you a performing artist in a wider sense? Are you a conceptual artist? I think I st still see myself as a flute player. That's mm -hmm. also very crucial and uh, that's, that's how I, I raised. I started very, f very early to play the flute. Um, so this is with me kind of all my life. Um, and I always wanted to do my own music, create my own music. So I played early in bands and um, um, yeah, and started to play jazz. Uh, so this is this. I'm a flute player. I'm an improviser, and I'm a performer, composer. And this environmental art is also very crucial. Became very crucial. Um, I started first with field recordings. And now I go really out in the nature and create on-site pieces. So sound art became also a part of what I'm doing. But it's all one thing for me. So it's <laughs> very difficult to say it's this, this, mm -hmm. this. So it's, it's, it's all me.
Um, tell us more about your sound artwork. I love to do recordings. I had a job as a sound designer. I think this is how I started to do field recordings because um, I was always searching for the sounds I wanted to have and they had this huge archive and it was really exhausting to go through the whole archive and listening to all these sounds. Mm. And I was like, it's much easier to do it by myself. And this is how I started. And then uh, in 2006, I, I created my first solo CD with just water and ice sounds and flutes and electronics. And um, yeah, and then step by step, I started to work uh, with the Landscape Quartet. This is a artistic research project uh, led by Bennett, Bennett Hock from the Newcastle University in, in the UK. And this is when we, when I or we all together went out in the fields and did research recordings. And then I started, so it was a logical step actually from doing field recordings outside, bringing them to the inside and then it was like we go outside, bringing our improvising skills to the outside. And then also recording, like doing field recordings became really an active thing. It's not just sitting still there. Even if I'm sitting still there, I feel like I'm doing something actively creative. Um, it's, it's an active listening. Mm -hmm. But I also started to play microphone, like to move the microphones around or <clears throat> I did a piece in a little stream in the UK. I had two hydrophones, different hydrophones, and then I just started to move them in the stream. So I improvised with the stream and the microphones. So it's an active process out there. You also did sound installation work. and. I'm wondering, maybe you want to say something about pieces that you created, but I'm also wondering to which extent do your experience of doing sound installation work, which has a completely different approach to time than performance-based work, how this work influenced your work in the field? Because it's a different time concept. Yes. Yes, I think with my sound installation, I often try to bring what's outside to the inside. Mm -hmm. Like this feeling that I have outside, this deeply connectedness I can feel. Uh, I, that's my goal. I don't know if it's always happened, but the goal is to bring this, an atmosphere from outside to the inside, but at the same time creating something new inside. Also play with the space inside but using these sounds from out there. Um, and for instance, I had this piece, Cairn, this uh, was a recording in Allenheads in Northumberland, and I put different sized bamboo flutes, banzuris in the ground and the wind played it. And so I took these sounds, these recorded, I recorded it, and I put these sounds inside and different sized speakers. So this was mm. the equivalent to the mm -hmm. different size flutes, the different speakers nice. and created a field of sound there of, and it was the wind playing the flutes. So it's, I try to connect this always somehow the outside and the inside, which is a crucial point in my work. I think this, also, when I work outside in the fields, it's like I, to connect my inner landscape, so to speak, with the outer landscape, and have so to get in, to have this connection, and with this connection or like feeling this connection, then this helps me to go in a creative process. One of the challenges of process-oriented work and conceptual work is how you communicate the piece to the perceiver. So when you have these experiences outdoors, you meet with another musician or performer, you do your performances somewhere outside. How do you communicate this to an audience? 
And I think this is a very crucial question because it turns you suddenly in a person who is also in charge of documentation. And then this also leads to the question about the art status of the communi of the um, documentation. Yes, that's a very, very good question because this is a question I I'm questioning out there. How do I, yeah, how, how can I um, bring this experience I had outside to the audience? Or it doesn't need to be the same experience, but they, mm -hmm. they have a experience. One thing is that you said the documentation, I think with the recorded landscapes, it does help that it has visuals. It might be difficult if it would be just um, an audio piece. Um, what I do with the recorded landscapes, um, I do a small meditation with the audience before we start playing the pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, <laughs> I dreamt about it the night before the premiere of the first four pieces. And I was a little, I woke up in the morning and was like, wow, this was a strong dream. And then I talked with Bennett about it. I said, you know, I dreamt that I should do a meditation with the audience, which is, I have to, was for me really a big step to do. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. so easy. And then he was like, you dreamt it, you do it. <laughs> so there was no question about it. <laughs> and I did it. And it was very well perceived. And for me, it's, that I sent the people to a place that they like, that they have a good memory of, and try to send them really to, to sense the place why they are sitting here in the room, but to have this memory of the place, how it smells, how it looks like, what the sounds are. And the feedback I got so far is that it really helps people on one side to be present in the space and forget about what was one hour before. Mm -hmm. But it also helps to perceive the piece different. So this is one thing I started. It's quite new to me as well. So um, I'm working on it. But also the documentation, I think it's uh, important. The, yeah, as I said, the visual side of it can help to um, bring the people to the place where we were. Um, and I think the whole documentation side, which started for me when I started with Landscape Quartet, to work with the Landscape Quartet, as it was an artistic research project. And in these kind of projects, you always have to document everything. And um, so this is somehow how it started also to that I work with visuals. So the documentation became an artistic part. What I find really interesting is that you seem, and I'm just observing this, mm -hmm. that you seem to avoid text. There is, you know, rather than describing the experience or having a score that you send to your fellow performer, you have a conversation rather than having program notes you have a guided meditation with the audience so i think this really mirrors beautifully what's actually happening in the pieces because they are so process oriented you also are process oriented even in the way you communicate them it's not a nice yeah. observation <laughs> <laughs> even i do write a program yeah. notes <laughs> But, um, but it's true, I, maybe I'm also not so good in texts. <laughs> but uh, I, I think I'm a very intuitive person. And this is, um, some things are hard to describe. And it's much easier to describe them via sound and image. And maybe feeling. The way you present documentations of your outdoor performances often includes performance in the indoor setting. Yeah. Would you share some thoughts about this? Um, 
like recorded landscapes is um, is something like this. The idea is to do the recordings on site, but not creating a piece on site. It's really gathering recordings, is gathering connection, stories, memories, and then I create this piece out of it. And these pieces have always um, there's place also to perform life to it. So we, as you think of a landscape, a landscape is different layers. It's a process of movement and time. And it's a recording, so to say. It's, it's a recording of movement and time. And when we are there, we record on top of this. We maybe read the recording and do another recording. And then we go to the inside and play to this. So there's an, a new mm -hmm. layer. Mm -hmm. So it just evolves the land. Like it's another piece of the piece. It's another layer of this recorded landscape. So in a way, the documentation is framed differently and becomes performance material for you? Yes, mm -hmm. and becomes... Actually, I, I don't look at it so much as a documentation, even mm -hmm. if it is a documentation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also... Um, the thing is, when we enter a landscape, I mean, if, if you ever can enter a landscape, you, you don't know where's the start, where's the end. But we always become part of it. Yep. So there is no, I'm doing, I mean, I do also like videos where you don't see any humans, but in this, in this case, it's part of it that we are in this landscape and we are part of this landscape and we mm -hmm. are part of the memory, we are part of the story that happens there. So it's quite normal that we are also in the image. Right. So it's the question, is this documentation, is this art or what is it? And, or, then, and then when I, I watch documentations of performances with these documentations, if you will, and then suddenly you have the performer on stage and you are performing with the recording of yourself performing in the landscape. So in a way, it's like a palimpsest where you develop different layers of musical communication. It's like a multi-part, not really counterpoint, but like a multi-part musical structure. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's us. I mean, it's right. like, it's a part of us was there at this moment in, in the past. And now we're in the present, but the past is, is still with us. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us about your new piece. The new piece is uh, with Philip Greenleaf. And when I talked to him about this recorded landscapes project, he was immediately into it. And he said, you know what, I bring you to the Joshua Tree Park. And I had no idea what amazing landscape this mm -hmm. is. Um, this trees, the stones, rocks, they are like sculptures. They are like somebody put them there. It's unbelievable that this is, there are no words for describing this landscape. I, and I have to say, I was um, very touched by it also. I, I was sitting in the field of this cactuses just the plural of cactus, cactuses. <laughs> um, and I cried and I, I cannot tell why. Mm. I was so touched by this. It was amazing. And the work with Philip, he's a player, he's an improviser. So we did a lot of playing on our actual instruments. Very often in the past pieces, I like, especially with Bennett, Hogg, I, you, you know, we, we work with the sand, we work with stones. 
And with Philip, it was very much about really playing in the landscape. And I, I think it was also the first piece where I brought my real flutes. In the other pieces, I very often play the bamboo flutes. I bring the piccolo, which is a practical reason also, like with a concert flute or the bass flute. It's sometimes difficult, but this time I brought them. Mm -hmm. So this is a big difference. And also, I thought about it later. All the other places had a soundscape. And Joshua Tree has a soundscape as well, but it's super quiet there. Except when you're too close at the street and you have the cars. Right. But we managed to find places with almost uh, no distraction. And I mean, this is the special thing about a desert, this quietness, the, the stillness. And we had one improvisation we did, this was in the evening, and this was really magic. <laughs> There's no video documentation of it, but it was at Indian Cove because the birds were really beautiful in the evening, the bird calls. And it was a very calm place and very special place. We both felt like this is this is such a peaceful place here and the birds started very you know here and then a bird called there and it was very sparse and Philip and I were standing I think there were 10 meters between us but we brought he brought his clarinet and I had my bamboo flute with me and then after five minutes or so we started really slowly to communicate with the birds and then the moon came up, the sun, it was mind blowing.
What does the composition process look like in a situation like this? You mean in a situation on site or No, no, afterwards? when you're working with the material. Uh, first thing is really gather the recordings, put the audio files to the video files, it's very... Um, and go through the material and finding... I mean, there are a lot of thoughts and ideas and talks we did on site. So I'm documenting this, writing it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so this time I, I have quite... I mean, it's always a little bit the idea of the details and the landscape. But this, this time it's really this... Um, how do you say? It? It's kind of a patchwork. Is maybe the wrong, the wrong th thing to say for this. But this park is, has like this patch is here with the cactuses. Then there are the ocotayas. Then there's the trees. Then you have a rock formation with white rocks, and then you have a rock formation with dark rocks. So it's it's all these different patches. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and we went to different places. Very often we, I have, or we have one place we work in, but Philip and I, we were really cruising through the park, so to say. So I have a lot of recordings from different parts of the park. And yeah, like to make a port portrait somehow of the park with all these different parts of it. So um, that's... So you are basically moving from object to object, creating a portrait. Yes, I think so. And we have also, we, this is what you do in America, <laughs> you drive a lot. So <laughs> I have a lot of recordings also from this driving mm -hmm. through the park. And a lot of stills, just like 15 minutes of landscape or where you think maybe it's a photograph, but they slightly yeah. changes. So this very slow transitions also. You mentioned that performing in the desert is different from all other places because there is very little in terms of soundscape there. How did you feel in terms of interacting? I understand that usually you want to interact with the place, but if there's nothing sonically to interact with, aren't you actually bringing something to the site? You always bring something to the site because mm -hmm. it's always us good point. being there. Yeah. So That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always a dialogue or it's always, even if there's no sound, it's a dialogue. It's like, I mean, you stand in front of these rocks and they speak to you. Mm -hmm. It's, um, yes, I would say so. They speak to you. They're so present. So there is something there, even if it's not hearable or audible, mm -hmm. but it's there. And also, I mean, there are animals, like one... One improv improvisation we did, this chipmunk always was just <laughs> jumping and listening and I, <laughs> it was always around. So mm -hmm. you don't see it on the video, but it's, um, it, yeah, <laughs> we played for, for mm -hmm. the chipmunk. But it's, so it's not that you need a sound to go in a dialogue. I see, yeah. It's the presence of mm -hmm. the objects or mm -hmm. the... I, do, I wouldn't even say object, it's, a, it's, it's an entity, it's something alive. I mean, these rocks, these trees, uh, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure Philip feels about this yeah. the same way. It's not a thing, it's pretty much a life. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing these insights about your work. This was really fascinating to learn. Thanks. Thank you.